Hi, um, morning everybody. Um, I'm Louise and today I'm going to be presenting at our journal club, um, Spot Sweeper, which is a tool for spatially aware quality control for spatial transcriptomics. This is a preprint for Michael Toddy, Stephanie Hicks, and Boy Go, who we do collaborate with from time to time here at Lieber. Um, yeah, and I think it looks like a promising tool for us to use in our spatial transcriptomics pipeline. So, a little bit of background and motivation for this tool. Um, quality control for spatial transcriptomics um, is like, I guess like we do QC on all of the different data types we work with and, um, and kind of thinking about these more high resolution technologies such as single nucleus and Visium, um, they kind of provide like present new and interesting challenges in QC um, and like across the board, poor quality spots or, you know, poor, poor quality samples or um, anything of like any resolution should be removed to improve the downstream analysis of your data. Um, and I think like initially when we started looking at spatial transcriptomics, we were kind of just applying some of the same quality control tools that we used on single nucleus RNA-seq data, um, which I'll talk about in a second, but they don't really account for some of the spatial information that exists in spatial transcriptomics. Um, so Spot Sweeper, basically like is a spatial specific tool that helps consider um, the quality of your spots, spatial terms, cryptomic, but in their local neighborhood and not relevant to the whole slide, which can like add some challenges. So talking about like quality control metrics. So oftentimes when we're looking at um, single nucleus and then also spatial data, what we consider as like a, I guess, spot or either nuclei level is what is the library size? Um, so like how many counts, we kind of call these different things, either counts um, or some UMIs, um, and then also the number of detected genes. So how many different unique genes are those counts adding to? Um, so also sometimes called some genes or total features. And then percent of map reads mapping to mitochondrial genes, where a lot of mitochondrial genes might mean that it's a super damaged piece of tissue we're getting, uh, uh, I guess like, more debris than we are getting like uh, more like relevant RNA. Um, so this is like also indicative like poor quality metrics. And often how we look at this is um, we look at the distribution over the sample for one of these metrics. So here, I know it's kind of tiny, but we're looking at the sum of UMI over a bunch of different Visium slides. And we can see that from almost all of them, they do have some spots that are very, very low. UMIs have low number of reads. So when we're talking about like if this was single nucleus data, we probably just drop these bottom spots. But when we kind of like think about the whole slide as a whole, uh, you can see that it can sometimes be a problem. Uh, I guess backing up, so we've typically used scran is outlier, which helps us find three MADs from the median uh, and then anything below that. So it's like a sample specific distribution cutoff, which works pretty well for single nucleus. However, we're finding that it's like pretty aggressive when it comes to spatial and an obvious pattern that we see over and over, and it is also slighted in this preprint, is that um, the white matter in brain tissue often has much more, much lower transcriptional transcript activity in white matter than gray matter. And so here I have plotted a Visium slide um, from the ERC where we have uh, uh, plotting MVP, which is a marker for white matter. So we see like it lights up here. So we've got white matter over here. Um, but then if we look at the scran discard and which, which spots would have low some UMI like based on scran is outlier, again, looking at that distribution cutoff, we can see that like the low libraries like also overlap with like where we think the white matter is. And this is like a pattern we see over and over again, but we wanna examine this. We don't wanna drop these spots. These are worthwhile spots and we wanna learn more about them in our analysis. So this is kind of like the problem that they're getting at. Um, so how they've sought to solve this problem, it's kind of shown uh, figure one in their overview figure. Um, so basically what they did is zoom in on one little area of the spots and basically for each so one spot at a time, we're gonna find the K neighbors for, for our spot. And then what we do is that we're going to rescale our quality control metrics to a Z-score based on the distribution of just their local neighborhood. So think if this spot was in the gray matter, like a 
with like a high counts, that makes sense in the gray matter. But if it was or, or low counts in the gray matter, now does it make sense? And the neighboring spots have high counts versus in the white matter where like low counts would make sense because there's we're in the white matter and the spot its neighbors also have low low counts. So that's kind of the idea. Um, so taking like the neighborhood, finding the z score for the metric for each one, and then doing outlier detection on that z score rather. Um, so that is the strategy. There's also another part of this that is artifact quality control, and that will be discussed more later. Um, so then they, the other half of this figure is they kind of like demo the ways that these, um, they can like show that this works and they overcome these biases that exist across the spatial organization of the tissue. So this first one is they're showing the distribution of, I guess we're looking at our, our classic, um, oh, I think it might've been this one. So I guess skipping ahead a little bit, Looking at the manual annotation data from our human pilots, this is the Maynard et al. Like um, these uh, manual annotations that get used over and over again. Uh, um, but basically, what we're looking at here is that we've shown that the distribution of the mitochondrial percent here is really variable across our different layers. Um, but if we use the z-score, we see that they kind of all snap to the same distribution. Um, and then again, if we had done like is outlier on these different distributions by the layer, different percents and also often high percents of our spots would have gotten dropped. However, if we look at the z-score to do outlier detection, now we're dropping a similar and also very low number of spots across our different layers. Um, and then we can also see that uh, we're, we're detecting these local outlier spots. It's just like a visualization of that. And then likewise with the artifacts. Um, so I think figure two actually digs into that idea about like the different distributions across layers more. So I think up here showing those layer annotations, the global outliers of how they would be kind of grouped um, both in like the pink layer one and then also in um, the white matter, which is this black layer over here. So we see that like the um, global outliers um, kind of like are grouped with these like lower transcript like transcriptional um, like regions versus if we snack to the local outliers, we can see this smattering of spots that's more spread out. Um, and then uh, again, with that idea about like library size per layer, we can see that it's very like variable across these different layers. And this is actually part of the expected biology of the tissue. Um, mitochondrial percent also like varies across these different layers and unique genes per layers. Um, so like this is like, that's kind of part of the biology of the tissue and less about like the quality. And this Z-score helps like those like snap, kind of snap to the same distribution. That's not like, I guess the idea, but like you can see that we're seeing the Z-scores kind of line up where we can actually find these like um, poor quality spots. Um, um, and then figure three, um, so this actually let them find kind of a funky pattern that happened. So basically finding these local outliers and what they found is that there are six spots in the Visium slide that just like over at the same X and Y from different samples were always being like the low quality spots. And they actually found that this existed across three different data sets. So the original human pilot one, the spatial DLPFC, which is the data that I worked on, and then also our, the, this mouse data set. So they found these six barcodes that kind of make this like, I don't know, kind of looks like Big Dipper to me a little bit pattern. Um, and basically like what they've diagnosed this as a problem with is that the synthetic barcodes like um, have certain chemers. So like the certain different patterns of like the bases that exist in the synthetic barcodes. Some of the spots are just more high, like, like, um, like sequence better than others. And some of these like cameras at these six spots like can be problematic and like don't don't work well. Uh, so our bias towards having like small, small library sizes. Um, so I'm also seeing some of these spots in my current Visium data set. So this is like an issue with like the, the Visium slide itself. And uh, I guess like the processing of it um, rather than like anything that's like with on our data. So that's kind of neat. Um, so then figure four, um, they talk about 
technical artifacts that are uh, common in spatial transcripts, common and kind of unique to spatial transcriptomics. Um, the first being this idea about a dry spot. So there is um, a liquid reagent that like makes the tissue permeable. And if as you're applying the tissue like to the slide, sometimes it doesn't reach the full slide. Specifically, this is a problem in the corners. Uh, so this is called a dry spot. So basically like the liquid reagent like hasn't made the tissue permeable. So like the spots and the, the tissue aren't like interacting correctly. Um, and they point out that this is not uh, visible in h &E, so it can't be diagnosed visually. Like we, until we get the data back, we don't know anything that was wrong with this slide. Um, but you can see it pretty clearly when you look at library size. You see this like dip in library size along the corner, even though the tissue looks totally fine. And that isn't really where we'd expect, I think, the gray matter to be in this tissue. Um, and then, but also you can see that there is, um, the, but there's no change in the mitochondrial ratio. So it's like, um, so that's like the change that we'd expect there. And then the other side is that it's like a hangnail. So it's a little, it's a piece of damaged tissue on the edge of the dissection that is like a result of, yeah, as a result of the dissection, part of the tissue is damaged. It's not a hangnail. Um, so this you can see in H&E. So you can kind of see this chunk of tissue here. Um, and so like here, we kind of know if the tissue has a hangnail or not. Um, and, but it looks the same, the library rate is the same, but then like the mitochondrial rate, um, we don't see the same variation that we'd expect in the rest of the tissue. And it kind of leads to in the incorrect clus clustering. I guess these both kind of lead to incorrect clustering, but um, the hangnail specifically doesn't cluster correctly. Like definitely like breaks how we'd expect the clusters to look. So the solution that they propose is that they have a function that detects these. Um, and how it works is that um, it finds reasons with low variation in mitochondrial rate. Um, so again, kind of using that same strategy where for each spot, we identify a neighborhood, we calculate the local variance for that central spot, and we adjust that metric using um, reweighting least squares. And then what we do is we perform PCA on the local variance. You can see that this is split very clearly into like two nice groups here. Um, clustering with K of two helps us find that hangnail region, that damaged region. Um, so that is like the strategy for finding these artifacts. And uh, yeah, so that is, um, I guess to summarize, uh, spot sweeper helps us find local outliers, and then it also helps us find global outliers, which improves upon the global outliers because it uh, takes into account the variation that exists naturally along the tissue. And then it also like has tools to find these two unique um, quality issues like, and that can affect like large regions of the tissue. So looks like a pretty useful, useful tool for us.